In quantum physics, there are a lot of crazy sounding ideas, but the Heisenberg uncertainty principle might just be one of the craziest. A lot of videos explain what it means, but very few dig all the way down to the very bottom and see where it comes from. So strap in and hold on. This one's going to get a bit bumpy. For those of you who haven't heard about the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, it was invented back in 2012 when a disgruntled Albuquerque chemistry teacher uttered the immortal words, Say my name. Heisenberg. Sorry, I had to go there. I know it, you know it. Simply couldn't be helped. Okay, moving on. The principle was really devised back in 1927 by German physicist Werner Heisenberg. Basically, what it says is that for a quantum system, you can't simultaneously know a particle's location and motion. Measure one very well and you know nothing about the other and vice versa. If you know where an electron is, you have no idea how fast or even if it's moving. That's the gist. In one dimension, we can use x to represent a particle's position, and we can use that particle's momentum as a measure of its motion. You could use velocity, but given the oddities of special relativity and quantum mechanics, it turns out that momentum is a better choice. Physicists use the letter p to represent momentum. Mathematically, Heisenberg's principle says that if we call the uncertainty in a particle's position delta x, and the uncertainty in a particle's momentum is delta p, then the product of those two objects must be greater than a constant called h-bar divided by 2. By the way, h-bar is the symbol we use for a quantity called the reduced Planck constant. It's simple, really. All it really says is that if you measure one variable well, you will measure the other one poorly. You can't simultaneously measure both well. To understand the fundamental origin of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we need to go way back to 1807, when Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier submitted a manuscript entitled Theory of Heat Propagation in Solids, except, of course, in French. This is yet another one of those cases when a physicist discovered something that was invented a century ago by a European mathematician. Typical. Okay, so what was Fourier's insight? Basically, he realized that for any function that you can build it by adding together the right amounts of sine and cosine waves. Don't believe it? Take a look at this very severe function. It's all square and stuff. How can you possibly make it using sine and cosine waves? Well, let's see. We'll start with a single sine wave. It kind of has the gross features we'd like to see, meaning it goes up and down in the right places but it's not very square. Let's see what happens if we add another sine wave, this one with three times as many waves and with an amplitude that is also one-third as high. Well, that's looking a bit better. What if we add yet another sine wave, this time with five times as many waves as the original and also with an amplitude one-fifth as high? This is starting to look promising. We can do this over and over again, and as we do, we see that the curve looks more and more like a square. Those little residual wiggles would go away if we did the process an infinite number of times. Cool, huh? By the way, if you want to see the actual equations, take a look in the link below. So that's the first idea, which is that we can create any function using a series of sines and cosines. The second idea is interesting. As I was adding more and more graphs, I was making this other plot, which kept track of how many different sine waves were added and how much amplitude each one contributed. The x-axis of the second plot is kind of funny. It's basically the number of wiggles, the number of wavelengths in a fixed distance. There was one, then three, then five, and so on. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to write the number of wiggles as w, and e equals one over the wavelength. Wavelength is written as the Greek letter lambda. Shorter wavelength means higher w. That's how it works. So now I need to make an important point. These two graphs, the square one with position on the x-axis and the one keeping track of how many sine waves were added in their amplitudes, which has w on the x-axis, represents exactly the same information. 
The two plots are effectively the same thing, but one records the shape of the function in position space, while the other one records the number and amount of waves, which we might call the function in W space. What Jean-Baptiste Fourier showed was that the two graphs contain exactly the same amount of information, and furthermore, how to transform from one to the other. The method is called a Fourier transform, and it's used all the time in electrical engineering signals processing and, as it happens, determining some deep truths about quantum mechanics. Now remember in quantum mechanics that everything is governed by a thing called a wave function. I made a video that goes into the wave function in more detail, and as always, the link is in the description below. However, the bottom line is that the quantum world is probabilistic. The mathematics tells you where something might be, but not where it is. Basically, where the wave function, actually the square of the wave function, is large, the particle is likely to be there. Conversely, where the square of the wave function is zero, the particle can't be there at all. The width of the wave function gives you a sense of the range of possible locations where the particle can be, which is a way of saying the width is a measure of your uncertainty of the position of the particle. So let's dig into a simple and somewhat realistic wave function. This one is called a normal distribution, sometimes called a bell curve, with a width we can call delta x. This width is a measure of the places the particle could be. Basically, delta x is the uncertainty in x. We can do a Fourier transform and find out what the shape of the curve will be in W space. It turns out that the Fourier transform of a normal distribution is also a normal distribution. That's just kind of weird, but it's how it goes. If you want to see the math, again, there's a link in the description. Now, here is the most important point. It turns out that the width of the normal distribution in W space is related to the width of the normal distribution position, or X space. So, if you do the math, you find that delta X times delta W is equal to 1 over 2 times pi. So what does that mean? It means that if delta X gets small, then delta W gets big and vice versa. They can't both be small at the same time. Okay, one last thing. You may not know this, but way back in 1924, a man by the name of Louis de Broglie was working on inventing quantum mechanics. He proposed in his PhD thesis that the momentum of a wave is equal to a constant called the Planck constant divided by its wavelength. We write Planck's constant as h, by the way. Since w equals one over the wavelength, that means that momentum is equal to h times w. And that, of course, means that delta p equals h times w. We can then divide both sides by h, and we have an equation for delta w, which we can then put into the equation we got from Fourier transforms of normal distributions. And we get that delta x times delta p equals h over 2 pi, which is the reduced Planck constant, which I remind you we call h bar. So this looks a lot like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, although it's missing that one half factor, which means that I haven't derived the uncertainty principle here. It turns out that that derivation is a little more complicated than the illustrative approach that we've taken in this video, and I don't want to get bogged down in the math. I put a link in the description for those of you that want to dive into that. But the detailed math isn't the point. What I wanted to show you here is the underpinnings of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So let's recap. One. A wave function tells you where a particle can be, and it has a range of possible locations that's called delta x. Two, any wave function can be built out of sum of sine or cosine waves. Three, Fourier transforms shows that the range of locations and the range of waves are connected. Four, the momentum of a wave depends on its wavelength. When you combine these four ideas, you have everything you need to see where the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes from. It's tied deeply into the principles of quantum mechanics and the fact that waves govern the quantum world and you can't get around it. Okay, so that was a bit long and a bit deep, but some topics are like that. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and share, and tell all your friends. Perhaps most importantly, I hope that you'll remember that while chemistry is interesting, physics is everything. <laughs>